All right, well, thank you to all of you for coming back for round two of multi-threading. So as I alluded to toward the end of the first segment of this presentation, there are more questions now than we started with. So what is the real question? The question is how can we do this without losing our minds? So I've gone over what multi-threading is and some of the terminology involved in it and when to use multi-threading and when to avoid it. Now let's talk a little bit about how to review multi-threaded code because this is extremely important. Doing code reviews is an awesome thing and if you do code reviews and you work in a multi-threaded environment and you don't know what to look for, you will miss things. And we, we uh, first have to deal with the case when you want to work with data that's being read and modified from different threads. I am out of order here. I'm completely out of order. What happened here? Yes, I am. I'm here. So if you have two separate classes, each of them have data, and in each of the destructors of these classes, you need to update data in the other object. And all of a sudden, those of you who have done some multi-threading will go, oh, this doesn't sound so happy because now I can see deadlocks on the horizon and I can see all sorts of places for this to go horrifically wrong. So how do we handle this with minimal blocking? This is where I started the design of libguarded. This is why libguarded exists, is to solve this exact problem that we encountered. So let's first look at the sample of how we look at shared resources in C++11 and many other languages. Say we have a phone booth. If you can actually find one out there, I'd be very impressed. But if you could find a phone booth, well, clearly only one person can use the phone at once. So since we want only one person to use the phone at a time, we make a rule. We love rules. We're programmers. We live by rules. We make a rule that in order to use the phone, you must be holding the handle, the door handle of the phone booth. This works because only one person can hold the handle of the phone booth. When you're finished with the call, you let go of the handle. The next person can come in and use the phone booth. So we're, we're using the door handle as a mutex. We're saying, if, if my hand is on this, you can't use this other object. But this is kind of confusing because the mutex is a random variable name. It has nothing to do with the data and shared data is what we're trying to manage. So we have you know, a couple of different mutexes here. There are different types of mutexes. They mean different things. Quick, what is my mutex 2 protecting? I have no idea. What am, I, what am I getting access to when I lock it? I don't know. I can't read this code. I don't know what it means. So let's talk about how to review multi-threaded code effectively and practices we can use to make it reviewable. So let's go back and look at some nice, simple, single-threaded code. Basic C++ code. We have some method. It's going to create an object. It's going to instantiate a new one. It's going to do some work, do some other work, and return it. Does anybody have any problems with this? Does this look like good modern C++ code? Yes. It's returning a raw pointer. Well, we don't like that in our code review, do we? This is, this is not safe. Any other comments on this code? Exception safety. Yes. <laughs> I'll, I'll give you both credit for that. <laughs> Exception safety. So I know. I can fix this code and I can get it through the code review. What I can do is I can add a comment above this code that says, do not mess up calling this code. Never add any call inside this function that could potentially throw an exception. And dear user, please make sure to always delete this object when you're done with it. Does that solve the problem? Are you happy in the code review? I commented my function with everything that you need to know to use it correctly, so it's, it's usable. Now, we don't do things that way anymore. We're C++ 11, 14, 17 programmers. We have smart pointers. We don't do this anymore. 
What if we have a slightly more complex example? This is a multi-threaded example, and I have a cache. And I've got the, the data structure is just a regular STD map. I've got some information in it, and I have the ability to insert data and look up data by key. Any problems with this? The object is never deleted, okay. Um, so I've shown you lookup so far. Um, that's right, I don't have an insert on this slide. Um, yes, yeah, so who's, who's responsible for deleting this object? Absolutely. Any other comments? I'm sorry? The thread annotation for guarding the variable? I'm sorry, I didn't quite understand that context. Okay, so you, you've got a question about the locking here. Okay, any other comments? Um, so your, your comment is about simultaneous reading. And actually, um, in this case, since I'm using a shared timed mutex, and I'm doing a shared lock, then I do have the ability to do simultaneous reads on the data structure. So my performance is fine. This will work, you know, the, the, I have multiple simultaneous reads. Now we're getting to the meat of this. So there's a couple of problems here. We have problems with cleanup because we've got a raw pointer. That could be fixable. We could use a shared pointer and things like that. But it's hard to see. It's hard to review this code. I'm using a shared lock. Operator bracket is not const on a map. If the key isn't present in the map, operator bracket inserts an empty entry. This is a write. We have a race condition. I'm writing to the map with a read lock held. This is really bad. This will corrupt the internal data structures and you will have a crash. So this is a problem because this was hard to see. This is a large room. This is a good sized code review. And many people took some time to be able to see this, I will bet. There's a better way. We shouldn't have a mutex and an object because they're not used as one consistent thing. We can encapsulate. We have objects. So I'm gonna set up a template called guarded. Guarded is a container for some data and a lock. So I'm gonna set up this, this template and you can construct a guarded. It just has a templated constructor. It passes whatever arguments that you have into the contained data and I have a function called lock. So this kind of looks like a mutex. It has a function called lock. But the difference is in a mutex, lock doesn't return anything. Lock just says, yay, you locked it. Well, what did I lock? I don't know. In this case, lock actually gives you a handle to the data that's being guarded by this object. So this means that the only way to access the data that's being shared is to lock it. And when you relinquish control of it because your handle goes out of scope, it's unlocked. How do we do this? Well, so we set up, and, and it also has the try lock um, implementations that you might need as well. This is nothing more than the combination of an object of type T and a mutex of type M. That's all this is, two things stapled together. And all we have to do in the constructor is just forward the arguments. That's, that's a nice C++ 11 feature, we have that. And then in the lock method, what do we do? Well, we lock the mutex and then we encapsulate the unique lock, which is a movable lock. So when, when we uh, call lock, sorry, when we create the variable lock, we're creating a unique lock, which is a, a um, uh, reference to the original mutex that can be moved around to various points in the program. 
And then we set up this handle, which is a combination of a pointer to the object and the deleter, which will release the lock when the handle goes out of scope. And try lock does exactly the same thing with modifications for dealing with the fact that it might fail. So we need to return a null handle, which will act like a null pointer. And the deleter itself is nothing more than a, a fairly ordinary unique pointer deleter that also maintains the unique lock so that when the value is no longer needed, when the unique pointer goes out of scope, we can release the lock. And that's all I need. Now I can go back to my restaurant and I can implement something a little more simply. This is not a huge change, but it makes the code more reviewable. Because if you see, when I lock the brick oven, I get an oven handle back. This is the only way you can get access to the brick oven, which means I now cannot have a race condition in this code. I can absolutely 100% guarantee there is no race condition in this code accessing this shared resource. Because this resource has been guarded, there's no other way to get access to it. This is a nice property because I can now look at the code and know that it's correct or at least that it has no race conditions. Not a huge difference, one line. You think, oh, that's, that's not that significant. But this generalizes. There are many other forms of guarded variables and these can be very useful. So for example, shared guarded is just the generalization of guarded to read write access. You have the shared guarded class. It has very similar implementation to the previous one. But in this case, our M, our mutex, is a shared mutex. And we have the ability to do the standard lock and try lock. We also have the lock shared and try lock shared. And these return a shared handle. What's the difference between a handle and a shared handle? Constantness, exactly. So if you acquire a shared handle to a shared resource, it's const. You can't modify the data. And there's a little more implementation here. Again, it's just an object and a mutex. This costs nothing. This is a zero cost abstraction because we needed the mutex and we needed the object anyway. This is just encapsulating it to give us a better syntax for dealing with shared resources. Now, if I implement my cache example, and I put the map in a shared guarded container, I can be guaranteed that if I were to write this code the old way, and I used operator bracket, it won't compile, because operator bracket is not const. It will correctly detect the fact that I'm doing a write access to something that I promised to only read. So I figure that out. I realize, oh, I have to use find. This is the non-mutating way that you access a map. And I write the code to do the lookup, check and see if the value was in there and, and return it appropriately. Any questions on that part? Yes, sir. Could I have put const on lookup and mutable on mutex? Um, in this particular case, yes, that would have solved the problem. In, in the original case, if I had made lookup a const method and I had made the mutex mutable, that would solve the problem. It would not solve the problem in the general case, however, because you're assuming that there's, for example, only one piece of data in that class and you only have one mutex. And so the constness of the method mirrors the constness of the data. Uh, but yeah, that, that is one possible solution that will solve that exact case. This is much more general. So let's look at the insert. Does this look good? Does anybody have any issues with this code? Now notice you're actually looking at the code and you're able to reason about what this means. 
I'm calling lock, which means I'm getting a write handle to this data, which means I have the ability to write to it in place as non-const. What don't you see here? A separate mutex. What don't you see here? A separate variable that has no meaning other than to guard access to a particular piece of data. This is a concise representation of what we're actually doing. We want to get access to a piece of data, write access, modify it, and then we're done. We can generalize this a little further because what if we're thinking in a very functional way? And instead of looking at imperative programming where we're going to get access to a piece of data and do stuff with it, we just want to be able to say, this is the operation that we'd like to do to mutate this data. We now have a way to phrase that, and this is a class called ordered guarded. Ordered guarded, instead of having a lock method, has a modify method where you pass in a functor, that functor receives the shared data, with it already locked, does the work, and returns. And this is kind of interesting because now, if I have a piece of code that uses ordered guarded, I have an interesting guarantee. If I know the functor that I'm passing in terminates, I know that that lock will not be held indefinitely. I know that that lock will be, up, will be unlocked once the operation is done because I've moved the handling of the lock-unlock into the guard. As, as again, as questions come up, please um, feel free to raise your hand as we go through this. Yes? Um, so the question was, does that not happen with the handle? And the answer is, well, the handle is movable. So you could acquire a handle, move it to somebody else, move it to somebody else, move it to somebody else, move it into some object that's long lived, keep moving it, and you could hold it for an arbitrary amount of time. Now I've said, if I see somebody using ordered guarded in code review, I know that all I need to see in order to know that this lock will be released is the code inside this functor. I don't need to examine anything else, and it's the only thing I need to know is, does this functor ever return? That's a much simpler thing to look for than, did this value ever escape this piece of code into some other place that I need to be aware of? Yeah, this is a, 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 it constrains the cases by which you can have the resource locked indefinitely to those cases where the, the functor never returns, which we're not in the habit, usually, of writing code that never returns, so it's much less common. Yes. Could you return a const handle and avoid the movability of it? Could you return a const handle and avoid the movability of it? You could certainly make it a, a non-movable, non-copyable type, um, but it's, that, that's another direction to go there. Um, non-copyable, non-movable types are kind of annoying to work with in this context. Um, the other reason to go this direction is so that we, we have the same shared lockability here because shared handles, I, I don't care as much if they escape, so I'm fine with that. So I have the same shared locking so you can get read access to this value any way you'd like, but you only can modify the value through this very specific API. So now, Let's generalize this a little further. All right, let's first look at the implementation of modify, which is just to lock the mutex and then call the function. So again, this is not complex code, but by wrapping this inside the functionality of the class, we can make more guarantees about what is possible from a threading point of view. So if I redesign the cache example, using ordered guarded, this is what I now have. And it's slightly more complex because I now have to pass in a lambda, but I can reason about the behavior of this in a way that I couldn't previously because the locking is no longer in imperative code. The locking is a side effect of the way I'm modifying the data. Yes, sir. You 
you're saying this is not quite correct because in place is not going to change the map if key was already in the map. That's true. That's a good point. <laughs> we can generalize this still further because now that we have a syntax for talking about the modifications to data, well now we can say, what if we want to defer the modification, eventual consistency? Can be very useful in certain scenarios, and I'll explain why. But first, the, the deferred guarded class itself looks very similar to ordered guarded. We have the modify. It's now called modify detach because the semantics are, I want this modification to happen, but it's going to happen at some later time. I don't know when, so it's detached from my processing. There is also modify async, which like the standard library async function, says takes some operation to be processed and gives me a future that I will be able to query to see when the task has been done. It may happen immediately, it may not. So this is a great way to get access to it. So you can mutate the data, generate a new state, return that from your functor, and then get access to it in the calling thread at some later time. I said this has a really interesting property. Why is it so interesting? Uh, and in order to implement this, we need a mutex. We also need a little more information because we need to keep track of whether there's pending work to be done because this data might be locked for shared reading at the time you try to make the modification. In that case, we'll just defer the work till later. So we need some housekeeping information to keep track of the modifications that are pending. Now I rewrite this with modify detach. It looks very similar to the example just a moment ago. But there's an interesting difference. Since this is detached, it's eventual consistency. I can look at this code, and without looking at the implementation of this functor, without looking at any of the work that's being done in this function, I can tell you with absolute certainty this code is deadlock free, accessing the shared data. Because we always have the option to defer the work until a time at which the resource is available. This is a really neat property to have, because I can now prove that my code has no deadlocks, and no race conditions. I like being able to prove that my code is correct in a code review. And I like being able to see that other people's code is correct in a code review. Any questions on that? Now there's a long sequence of generalizations of this concept that you can build. So I've built guarded, shared guarded, ordered guarded. Uh, most of these are available in C++ 11. Since some of them need a shared mutex, they require either C++ 14 or boost thread, or your favorite implementation of a shared mutex. Then we have deferred guarded that I just went over. There's also LR guarded, which uses the left-right algorithm. Um, to obtain a lockless implementation of the guarded concept. This uses more memory because it has to maintain two separate copies of whatever it is you're guarding. But on the other hand, readers never block. There's, it's completely non-blocking for readers. And readers never see data older than one write ago. So you can never have more than one pending write. It has a bunch of very useful properties. There's an entire menagerie of guarded semantics that you could develop based on this concept. So this is awesome. I've solved multi-threading. It's done. And then there's one uh, additional one, the copy on write guarded system, which gives you shared access without locks because since it's copy on write, the data never changes while you're looking at it. Um, this is also nice because it has some transactional semantics. You can always cancel a pending write because you just throw away the copy that you were working on and it reverts to its original state. It was very useful. Like I said, multi-threading, done. And talk's over, we can go home. And then we tried to solve the problem, again, that I developed LibGuarded to solve. 
In our CS signal library, we have a sender object and a receiver object in every signal connection. So I have a push button connected to a window. When the push button is clicked, I want the window to close. The sender has a connection list. It needs to know who to send signals to. The receiver has a connection list. It needs to know who to disconnect from when it's destroyed. So each of these destructors has to update the list in the other side of the connection. And I tried to implement this using the libguarded technology that I've showed you, and it didn't work. And I couldn't phrase this problem in terms of the abstractions that I'd built. So, I took a step back and I said, okay, is there another way we can do this? Is there something else we can implement along these lines that gives me the behavior I want? So, first of all, what order should I lock the containers in when I do this? Well, I have to lock the sender's list and the receiver's list. And the push button destructor has to read its own connection list and then lock the sender's receiver list. And the window destructor has to lock its own sender list and lock the sender's connection list. So, oh, I can't order these in any direction that will induce a correct ordering for everyone because I can't even find the sender as the receiver until I look in the connection list. So well, what do I do here? Well, there's a lot of algorithms for dealing with deadlock avoidance that you can find in textbooks. So the first option is the most popular, unfortunately. It's not a problem. Deadlocks are rare. It's no big deal. And then, you know, it, it, deny responsibility is getting harder now that we have pretty much universal access to source control. So I don't really recommend that one. Um, you could always just wait, lock, unlock repeatedly. Maybe that'll work. Um, it's, th that test is flaky, so we're not going to trust that that test is correct. We'll just pass CI anyway. It's vitally important if you have this situation never to run thread sanitizer on your code because it will find this problem. Even if the deadlock does not occur, it will warn you of the incipient deadlock in your code. So just pick one of these and, and we could stop there. But I'd like a solution that actually works. So when we were designing CS Signal, we are saying, okay, well, this is a library that needs to be multi-threaded, but we're delegating all responsibility for threading to libguarded. We have a threading problem. Therefore, it should not be solved by the user of the threading library. It should be solved in the threading library. It's totally valid for both of these destructors to be active simultaneously. We need a sane result. So we need a guarded type that can handle this. We didn't have one. So here's the properties we need. We need a thread-aware container, not just a thread-aware object. We need a thread-aware container where the writers don't block the readers, and readers don't block at all, and iterators are not invalidated when the container is modified. If I had these properties, and I don't care how the implementation is, then as the writer of the signal library, I can write my code and it will just work. So how do we do this? How do we, in libguarded, provide this abstraction? Two classes, RCU guarded and RCU list. Since we're implementing a container, these classes need to work in concert. The RCU guarded is the outer wrapper that enforces access to the shared container, and then the container itself has to be written in such a way that it's aware of the threading that's going on. So what's RCU? Well, it's an algorithm used in many pieces of code, including the Linux kernel. It's a well-established algorithm for managing linked lists in a multi-threaded way. The classical RCU algorithm is one writer at a time, so writers block writers. That's okay. We can, we can deal with that requirement. That's fine. We have room for multiple concurrent readers. Readers take no locks at all, and readers never block writers. So if I can make this work, then I can make my solution work. But how do you do this in C++ user space? I'm missing a slide here. Um, the Linux implementation 
of this is very different from a user space C++ implementation because it can depend on the fact that it's the kernel and it knows how many threads are active and it knows when they're busy and when they're not. We don't have any such facilities, so we need to build a slightly different system. To the, the basic bare bones of RCU is, is actually fairly straightforward. We use a linked list of nodes. And whenever we want to modify a node, instead of modifying it in place, we read that node, we make a copy of it, we update pointers so all subsequent readers see the new copy. And then later, we get rid of the old node. Later. What's later? How do I know? When? Well, as I alluded to, the kernel knows when later is because it knows when all threads that could potentially have access to a particular piece of memory are no longer active. We don't have access to that. We don't have a grace period during which we know all threads will not be touching memory. We know that users like to hold references for a while. They might have use for this container for some decent period of time. So we don't want to enforce things like you can't sleep while you're holding a reference to this. That's hopeless in user space. We don't know how many threads there are. So we can't know when they're all done. And we don't really want to block the writer until all the readers are finished. Because we don't know how many there are. It could be starvation. So what we do is we set up the RCU guarded class. It has a very simple API. It has the ability to lock the container for reading and lock it for writing. And as you would expect from the way that shared guarded is implemented, the read lock gives you a const handle. So you can't mutate the list. You can traverse it, you can't modify anything. The non-const method takes an exclusive lock because remember, writers block writers in this case. So, and it returns a write handle. You have access to modify the list as you see fit. The RCU list itself is, just acts like a container. It's a STL compliant container. It has a beginning and an end, an insert, pushback, all the things you would be familiar with with a linked list. The insert algorithm just allocates the new node. We initialize the pointers in the new node to refer to the adjacent locations in the list. And then we update the next and the previous in the adjacent nodes to point to the new node. And this works because since we do all of these updates atomically, since we have atomic values in C++, this is straightforward to use the standard library for, as a reader is walking concurrently, it will either see the new node or not. We don't make any guarantees about consistency, just correctness. And the only guarantee we have is if, as a reader, you traverse the node from the you traverse the list from the beginning to the end, you will see all of the nodes which were alive during the entire period of a traversal. Other nodes which were created or deleted while you were traversing the list, you may or may not see, but you will successfully traverse from a beginning to an end of the list. Erase gets a little more complex. The first thing we do is update the adjacent pointers to take this node out of the list so that subsequent readers will not see it. We mark the node as deleted so that we know that this is one that has expired and is no longer needed. And then we add it to the head of a list. This list is called the zombie list. And it consists of nodes which are no longer part of the list if you were to traverse it, but they may still be referenced by some active reader. Again, concurrent readers might see the old node, or they might not. It might be gone by the time they get there. And there are a few corner cases to deal with when you're dealing with the head or the tail of the list, but this is a, a, a piece of code that just uses the intrinsic C++ atomics and, and does this algorithm. Now we get to the heart of this system, which is the zombie list. We need a way of knowing when each node that has been erased could no longer be referenced by any active reader. And the way we do this 
is by this ancillary singly linked list structure. Each one of these nodes contains a pointer to the next structure in the zombie list, a pointer to the actual zombie node that it is protecting, and a pointer to essentially the iterator that is active and reading this current area. When we lock the data structure for reading, we add an entry to the zombie list. So there is some cost to a read lock in this implementation. When the reader is finished, we walk from that point in the zombie list forward, seeing if any other reader is still active. If there is, we're not the oldest reader. So we just remove ourselves from the list and leave everything as it is. If we get to the end of the zombie list before we find another active reader, then all of the entries we walked over along that path could not be referenced by any other reader. We are the oldest reader alive, and all of these nodes were deleted before we started reading. Therefore, we can free them all. So we do so and we free the zombie list entries as well. Any questions on that? What's your memory overhead when the, the average CPU overhead? Um, it's a few bytes of memory and one malloc, which is unfortunate, but it's required for this implementation of the algorithm to work. Um, this is one place where a, a very efficient thread aware allocator is very useful, and many implementations are quite good these days. And this is required if we want the property that writers don't have to wait for all the readers to finish because we want the, essentially the last reader who could potentially have seen the data to do the cleanup of that data. Does that make sense? I'm sorry? Ah, that's true. The, the, there is no separate thread that does the reclamation. That, that is also a possibility. There's, there's many ways to handle the reclamation, but this algorithm allows you to know deterministically and precisely exactly when every piece of deleted data is no longer needed by any active reader. Why a zombie list and not a ref counted node? That's an excellent question. And the reason why a ref counted node doesn't work is because you would have to ref count, you would have to somehow know how many readers were active at the time the node was deleted. And you would have to then have each reader check in and decrement the ref count of every node that was deleted while they were processing. So it could be potentially a very expensive operation if you have many deleted nodes. At least this way, it's a single, singly linked list traversal for each reader um, termination. Um, what, what it, he says, wouldn't it be the same because you're just compressing the ref counts, compressing the nodes that have a ref count of zero? Um, if I'm understanding you correctly, it's not quite the same because the zombie list only contains nodes that have been deleted. So it's only proportional to the delete bandwidth of your process. Whereas if you had a ref counted implementation, um, I think there would be places where you might have to do work proportional to the number of nodes that were traversed during the read process, which could be, it depends on your, your particular situation. It might be a win in some workloads, um, but it seems like it would not be in most cases. Does that answer your question? Okay, other questions?
But, so the, the question was something about sequential consistency. I, I didn't quite get the full context. If you had one thread writing and you had another thread holding on to a stale read, then you would eventually have ordering issues. Um, no, you wouldn't, because as nodes are inserted or deleted, the reader that's traversing the list will either see the nodes or not, but it will always make forward progress in the list. No node would ever move positions from one place to another in the lists. And since we don't, um, uh, since we don't deallocate a node until all readers that could potentially have seen it are finished reading, there's no possibility for the ABA problem where you deallocate a node and then allocate a new one at the same address. That can't happen while a reader is active. Does that answer your question, or am I answering a different question? <laughs> Okay, uh, definitely talk to me afterwards and we'll, we'll figure out, we'll hash that one out. Other questions? Just a quick comment on the question that was asked before. It's possible to do it with a reference count and there are some interesting trade-offs on performance you can make. The straightforward implementation has all the problems Hansel was talking about. There is another implementation that if you want to hear about that, come to my talk tomorrow. But you can get a better performance for readers at the expense of the writers. You, you can get better performance for writers at the expense of the readers. There are a lot of different trade-offs you can do. It's a you know, whole complex mess of these RCU algorithms. Okay. Uh, Thank you. As identified, every one of these algorithms has multiple trade-offs, and which one fits best in your scenario is, is uh, sometimes a, quite a research project to discover what's going to have the performance behavior you want. So some additional notes about the RCU list. So the read lock, as you would expect, returns a read handle to the RCU list, and a read handle can be used to acquire an iterator. And this iterator is valid as long as the read handle is in scope. Normally, when you erase elements out of a list, it invalidates iterators, at least to that element. But this is a really nice guarantee, and it's a guarantee that you actually must have for safe traversal of a concurrent data structure, in that no operation on this list will ever invalidate any iterator that is valid at that time. So just, okay? just for historical purposes, there. Uh, actually was a variant of the Linux kernel to use something kind of like this. Um, it didn't have the snapshot capability. This was C rather than C++ after all. Uh, but it did use the trick where the unlock would do the cleanup. Okay. Um, good to know. The, uh, it was uh, specialized for real-time systems, fairly small CPU counts. Um, and it was the real-time variant for a while until I figured out a way to make something like, uh, to make real-time preemptible RCU scale to thousands of processors. So. Historical note, I mean, it's a way that has been done, so it's a, I, I would consider that a uh, compliment in some sense. All right, thanks for the note. Another item that's required here is there's a very subtle issue when you're traversing an RCU list of this type, which is if you, say, pick a range out of the middle of this list, so you grab an iterator to some random element and an iterator to some other random element, and you say, I want to traverse between these two points. You may fall off the end of the list because your end iterator may refer to an element that isn't in the list by the time you get there. So you never stop. This is a problem. The fix for this is to disallow comparing iterators. Well, if you disallow comparing iterators, how do you ever know when you're done? Well, you have begin and end return different data types. So begin returns a normal iterator, what we would all think of as a standard iterator. End returns just a sentinel value that denotes the end of every RCU list. So the only thing you can compare is an iterator against end. You can't compare two iterators together. This unfortunately means that until you're in C++ 17, you can't use this RCU list in a range-based four. 
because this was, it was not permitted to have begin and end return different data types until C++ 17 if you're using range-based for syntax. Just a little minor note to be aware of. You can still use it in a regular for loop or a while loop or whatever other construct you want. There's no synchronization between readers, so modifying an element, the data in an element of this list, could result in a race condition. Therefore, all iterators are const. This will prevent you from having race conditions unless you have mutable data in your elements, which is a bad idea. So in order to modify data in an RCU list, you want to use insert and erase. You, you shouldn't ever modify the elements directly. If you look at it and go, oh, this iterator is const, let me just make my data mutable so I can get around it, you will shoot yourself in the foot. And as I mentioned in my first talk, there's gonna be more content on this and many other subjects on our YouTube channel, new content every two weeks. And, and uh, all our information is available on GitHub. You can contact us via email, or get all of our source binaries and documentation files on our download website. And please do subscribe to our YouTube channel. We have more information on multi-threading, C++, our libraries, data types, and all manner of things of interest to the general C++ community. Thank you very much. Time for questions. So I'll throw the f the questions and All right. wow, I answered questions apparently. <laughs> well, if no one will ask a question, I will. Um, so you say multi-threading is a solved problem. I was saying multi-threading is a solved problem quite sarcastically. I hope that came across. Yeah. Uh, what I want, and um, what I want to ask is, would it make sense to combine this library with sort of an executor-based pattern? So the I think they can really interoperate really well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there you have uh, some some kind of high-level level abstraction up on top of a thread. Yeah, there, there definitely is room to combine something like this with executors. Um, this would be sort of a natural building block for working with executors, thread pools, all kinds of more high-level abstractions that deal with, with uh, synchronized, synchronizing and sharing data between threads. But you consider it a separate thing? I think I would, I would, I think I would consider that a separate layer. Um, this is sort of, libguarded in my opinion is kind of the, the um, atomic unit of shared data, if I can overload a term in a really terrible way, <laughs> to, um, to work with shared data in a multi-threaded program correctly. And like anything low level, you can always build higher level abstractions on top of it that have greater creature comforts, um, more you know, performance implications, things like this. I think something like this would be very useful to have a, a guarded data aware work queue because it would give you the opportunity to do things like scheduling tasks whose resources are available, things like that. Um, that's well outside the scope of this particular talk, if not this library. Um, but it would be, I think, a very useful thing to have. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Well, thank you all very much.